New week on the Just Baseball Show. Happy uh, first, I guess, Monday night football game. Like, I'm actually really excited to watch Aaron Rodgers with the Jets, which is odd, but that's kind of the nature of the beast. Jack Aram, we're going to talk about Yoshinobu Yamamoto in Japan, who just threw his second no-hitter. He did it in front of Brian Cashman. This guy, I think he's en route to his third Sawamura Award, which is the J- Cy Young in the NPB. Um, he could be a big money free agent. So we're going to kind of talk about what that guy could command when he comes stateside next year. Um, the Marlins took two from Philly, which was fascinating. Evan Carter got called out by the Texas Rangers. Jason Dominguez hits the men for probably a, a long time. We'll see how many games he truly misses. Um, and then we got to get into this Steven Strasburg thing. And uh, one of the other podcasts on the Just Baseball Network is doing something really fun this week. So we've got a lot to kind of bounce around with. Um, the Dolphins, how did the Dolphins and the Chargers do? I just took a nap. I don't know. Oh, it was unreal. Great finish. I was watching it on my phone, uh, but they pulled it out at the end. One by a touchdown. It was a high scoring game and two uh, threw for, I think, the most yards in an opener. Uh I think I think it's the fourth most ever, like right behind Dan Marino and Tom Brady and one other guy from the 50s I've never heard of. Uh, so definitely, definitely a good opener for my fins. OK, good. I like that. And you were at Cubs Diamondbacks this week. Yeah. Man. You were at the Steel start. You weren't at Gallon's complete game shut up, but you were at Saturday uh, when the D-backs won 3-2 and 10. Yeah, that was a heck of a game. And, and you can feel the buzz in Chicago and, you know, Stroman apparently, you know, going to potentially come back which is exciting i think they're going to use him in some sort of relief role right because they're not going to be able to build him up in time and they'd rather have him in some capacity than you know try to build him up and throw him straight out in the postseason regardless marcus stroman being on that active roster and being able to come into games i think is only going to inject more life into that team uh, it was a back and forth game really close one really fun merrill kelly shoved steel shoved and you know d-backs edged it out but to me it just feels like I know Gallon's kind of like closed the gap a little bit with that complete game shutty, but Justin Steele has just been the epitome of consistency. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk. We've talked a lot of Cy Young. We'll circle back later, but I, I did feel like I was watching one of the best pitchers in baseball. Just the way that he was. Car- I, I don't know if it carries over into next year. We know guys just have special seasons and things like that. But watching Steele in that start, man. In person, too, just kind of the way he's strutting his stuff. I saw him between innings uh, when I was kind of going in the back area. You could see uh, the, the I would say, the batting cages behind the, the clubhouse. Behind yep. the clubhouse, you can see into the batting cages. And between innings, he was in there by himself, just sitting down, watching the game on the TV, like doing his own thing. He's got his system now. He's in a rhythm. And when he's out there on the mound working quick, he just looks like a guy who who is fearless right now on the mound. And he, he looks like a Cy Young winner. Yeah. And you say we're going to talk about it later. We're going to talk about it tomorrow with Walker Bueller and Walker going to come on and and talk about kind of his, you know, saga at this point and in, you know, shutting down for the rest of the year in terms of a rehab. He will not be back. He's going to talk about that tomorrow. So be sure to tune in to get Walker's perspective on that. We're also going to get his perspective on the Cy Young races in the AL and the NL. But Steelman, you saw the first earned run he allowed in three starts. He's worked 21 innings of one run ball. He's punched out 12 plus six is 18 plus eight is 26. And he's walked three. Yeah. Come on. That's good stuff. That's great. Again, it's just pounding the zone. It's consistent. It's tempo. It's just, he just looks great. Uh, The other side of it, it was really cool to see Jordan Lawler at the big league level. He looks awesome at shortstop, but man, he looks, uh, the game looks a little quick for him at the plate right now. We'll see if he settles in a little bit, but regardless, I think you look at it like, you're getting an uber athletic Nick Ahmed if if yeah. the bat isn't there yet. <laughs> you know, if he's if he's not totally translating offensively yet, you know he's gonna give you similar defense to Ahmed at this point. You know, Ahmed isn't exactly the defender he was in his prime. More speed. He stole second base in that game after a fielder's choice. He just looks a little bit overmatched right now, but I, that's why I'm glad they called him up now. He's got a little bit of time to continue to help them. And again, Perdomo hasn't been great either. So you can kind of try to ride the hot hand, play matchups, and you have two guys that are probably going to be inconsistent anyways. Uh, at least have it be two young guys. So I'm a, I'm excited to see what Lawler does. I was really impressed with the defense at short, though. That, that part of the game didn't speed up on him at all. Yeah, the one that got me going was sliding to his backhand into a spin and Ooh. a gun at first base. That was – you saw a second game of Jordan Lawler. That was in his debut. And 
Like yeah. my favorite thing was, okay, they immediately cut to parents. Parents are giddy. And then you go back to Lawler, who's like getting it to throw it around the horn. And he's just like smiling. This guy's yeah, having, having fun. fun. And I think having fun for him looks like amazing defense. Yes, he swiped a bag. Yes, he's got a couple of knocks so far. But yeah, I, I think the real value and the real fun for him is defensively. And that's I don't, like, I'm not, I'm not victory lapping here but you know i've long been team lawler as opposed to team meyer and that's kind of why i'm team lawler because i yeah. feel like there's just there's so much excitement defensively yeah. and there's so much excitement when he gets on first base as opposed to meyer it's all about what he does in the batter's box yeah you know i, I and that's it's unfortunate he's shut down for the year uh with with a shoulder issue that he tried to play through and if you look at the numbers pre and post it's it's pretty crazy with meyer so yeah, I agree. Like those guys have always been stacked together, and and while we're just kind of almost no pun intended in this one, where it just he just outran him. Like he just totally separated himself this year, and it, and it was of course because Meyer struggled and with the injuries and everything like that. But yeah. I don't think we see Meyer at the big leagues this year, it really in any event. Lawler, I thought it was incredibly unlikely to see him at the big leagues this year, and it was. It took him playing out of his freaking mind and just not stopping at every single level while also showing that he can impact the game in so many ways. So I'm interested to see how the bat continues to develop. I think if they keep putting him against lefties, like this was one of those instances where they said, okay, he's going to start every game against lefties at shortstop. Well, he got one of the Cy Young favorites who happens to be a left-hander. So it's not like that was a, a favorable matchup for him. When he gets some, you know, middle of the rotation arm southpaws. I want to see how he does then uh, because the right on right sliders, those have overmatched him, but maybe he can continue to you know, perform against lefties. Like we said, going into this debut, 377 batting average OPS, well over a thousand dating back to the start of 2022 against Southpaws. So looking forward to seeing what Lawler can do. And the D-backs are you know, kind of fighting out of it and showing some, some life as well. I would say wait till he gets to Jose Quintana tonight, but Quintana has been a three ERA guy since he's come back. So like yeah. Quintana might actually be considered good. Um, he is real quick. You ripped off a heinous Wrigley field take. You said the concession options sucked. Are you kidding me? Oh God, you just, Take a when lap. it comes to food, you just, you just want to get me killed. You just want to get yeah, me but killed. Like, dude, like, it's Wrigley field. Like there's something about that. Wrigley field. I, Wrigley field's unbelievable. I love it. It's, it's one of the, most incredible places in sports, but you can find the food. same. It's the fame food stand every 15 feet. You it's the same thing for a five Wagyu. Are you Peter? No, I'm just, I'm <laughs> no, I, I, Peter would cook it himself. <laughs> I'm looking for just, just variation. It was hot dog tenders, the Italian beef and like sausage, right? Like, I don't know. I, I, most stadiums have variation now. They have something that makes them uniquely them. I guess it's the Italian beef that makes them uniquely them. Yeah, I think so. Like the White Sox, yeah. it's it's Bona or something. Like Wrigley, it might be Bona too. I don't know. But like they've got an Italian beef. Go get an Italian beef. You're in Chicago. Or they have the best hot dog in baseball. It's better than that, the dude, Dodger dog. Okay. It's better than the Fenway Frank. All right. Yeah. Hot dog take. Come Every, on. All, all the hot dogs are the same. No, I they're not. Say, no, they're not. People say like, like the Fenway. They're all Nathan's hot dogs. They're all. No, Ooh, Wrigley's is not together. Nathan's hot dogs. It's all the same, dude. It's all the same. I, I when you tell me, oh, this hot dog's better than that. That's just the most like cap of all. They're all the same. They're all low grade meat that you put in a slightly stale bun. Like that, all the hot dogs are the same. People told me Fenway Franks, disgusting. It's just Fenway like every Franks other are hot gross. Dog. No, well, those are special too, apparently. No, man. Wrigley's got the, the snap of the weenie, man. Come on. That's a good glizzy. Uh, best dog in baseball belongs to Wrigley Field. Um, I'm okay, sure I'll get killed for this. <laughs> Jordan Lawler to Evan Carter. Evan Carter comes up. He's the corresponding move to Adolis Garcia hitting the injured list. I was shocked. Like, honestly, more shocked than the Lawler one. Because um, mm -hmm. I thought they had a, enough waiting in triple a or just like hey they'll tap into the depth on the bench and they'll bring up a quadruple a guy to fill in as as bench depth pretty much um carter they they make the move to and carter lasers a single through the pull side for his first big league hit yeah um this guy looks right at home man and and i guess that was on me for not expecting him to look right at home because he's patient he's big he controls his body so well and dude like I don't know. I guess I was expecting a couple games where he looked overmatched to a certain extent because he only had 10 games in AAA. But now, man, I, I don't know. I, I think he could just be here to stay. 
Well, I think he's going to contribute in in certain spots. I think it's extremely aggressive. You mentioned the hit to the pull side. Like he's very much a pull centric hitter right now, uh, especially with with like the damage that he does. It's it's pretty much all to the pull side. I think there's some things that like he could clean up in the off season in terms of what will translate to the big league level. It's out and around the baseball a lot, and I think big league pitchers will kind of expose that a little bit more. So I'm interested to see how he does you know, as this, as he gets more reps out there, but especially against secondary stuff, he's yanking kind of everything. So if he catches balls in the right spot, he'll have success. I, I really thought this was kind of a sign of, of desperation. Like, I love Evan Carter. He's a number 11 prospect for us. Uh, and, and that was when we put out the list amidst some of the, the struggles he was having at one point in double A. Yeah. I think he's a, one of the safest and most well-rounded prospects in baseball. He just turned 21. But to me, this was like a desperation move for the Rangers because, like you said, you could call up a quadruple A guy. But if you have a ton of confidence in your team, you just want somebody to to plug the leak. You don't you don't really need anything else. But we talk about how this lineup has gotten so much shorter and how this team is just you know, faltered a lot. And Evan Carter has the chance to be one of those rookies that hits the ground running and goes crazy because he's so especially talented. But that said. He also has the potential to get blown up because he just turned 21. You mentioned the lack of reps in, in AAA and some of the things that you can kind of see in the swing that might get exposed at the big league level at this juncture of his you know, development. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested to see how it goes. But to me, this was the Rangers saying, give us the highest upside guy, the guy that can maybe give us a shot in the ass and see what happens. And, you know, I, I agree. He looks comfortable. And the one thing he's going to work counts. He, he, makes a lot of contact. He's he's going to grind out at bats. He's a good defender, especially if you're not playing him in center. Uh, but it, it, to me, this was kind of a, a desperate move. Like, let's try to just shake something up. Yeah, if they weren't desperate, I thought J.P. Martinez was a shoe in And yeah. this guy's like 27 years old. He's 33 for 37 in stolen bases. He's hitting 310. He's got a 990 OPS. Like, that was just going to be the guy that they turned to. When I saw Adolis went down, I was like, oh, we're going to see J.P. Martinez. Like, that'll be a great story when he gets up. But no, like, it's it's a better story now because he got one of the top prospects <laughs> in the game. Do I think J.P. Martinez deserves a big league shot? Yes, absolutely. Um, was this the more aggressive decision? Yes, absolutely. Is it going to pay off? I don't know. We'll see. But at the very least, I think you look at it like how much difference of production going to be. It's probably going to be a quadruple A guy versus Evan Carter. Like Evan Carter, even if he's not totally contributing consistently, he's still going to run into some balls on his pole side. He's still going to walk. He's fast. He's going to play really good defense, like I said, in, in corners. He's, I think, a good defensive center fielder. I think that's an underrated aspect of his game. Yeah. Uh, but they they bring him up and, you know, kind of in the midst of, I would say not his best stretch. And and that's why I was surprised by it. This is a guy that, again, is I think trying to work through some things. And uh, you, you look at some of the the performances he's had against secondary stuff at the upper levels. And uh, again, I think that's part of the struggles with, with the pull happy approach. And it, he hasn't been as good against secondary stuff this year, but you know, he, he had a nice little stretch of a few games and uh, at the end of the double a gets promoted to triple Brief taste there. We know AAA PCL is not the best for development. So maybe there's some things that he, you know, he'll continue to learn and develop at the big league level. But again, he has the potential to just kind of have things click and go crazy. And I think they need somebody that has that, you know, because at the end of the day, he's a number 11 prospect for a reason. It's yeah. because he has every day above average regular potential all star upside. Uh, I just don't know if he's ready to translate that at the big league level yet, but I'm excited to find out and I'm pumped that they brought him up. I'm, I'm always going to be pro aggressive prospect promotion, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if this was like the easiest transition for a guy that's still kind of working on some things with his swing. It definitely wasn't. And we'll see if it works, but if there's any team that's like hovering over the panic button that is, you know, in wildcard contention right now, It's the Texas Rangers at this point because of how quickly things have kind of fallen off the rails. Like other teams, it's been a slow burn. And there were points where, you know, San Francisco looked entirely out of it. But then San Francisco cut a couple games stretch and they have some teams in front of them lose a couple games. And like they look back in it, Texas, it was damn, they're the best offense in baseball to then all of a sudden they were on the outside of the wild card picture looking in. So, yes, it it could have been panic inspired, but. You're right. Before we move on to the Martian, what does the best version of Evan Carter look like? Just for for Rangers fans to dream on, is it 330 bombs? 
I don't know about 30 bombs. Uh, the thing is, is there's a lot of room to get like stronger, which is interesting too. Cause he's, he's got a long frame. He's got plenty of room to add more muscle in there. But to me, I think he's still always going to be kind of hit over power, which, mm-hmm. which is a, a good thing because there's still sneaky pop in there. And I think he's trying to strike that balance right now, because again, you, you see how, how much he wants to go pull side and how he tends to be out and around the ball. And I think with his, he's got long levers, like he could have power to all fields. So I think when it's all said and done, Carter could be a guy that's hitting yeah, close to 300, around 20 home runs, walks at a good clip. It's probably going to be 280. I mean, who hits 300 nowadays anyways? But if he's a 280 hitter, 20 to 25 homers, uh, mixes in a handful of stolen bases and, and walks and plays good defense, that's a consistently above average regular that if you play him in left or in center field, it's going to be good for a long time. Uh, so I, I think he's a high four big leaguer that is going to contribute for a while. If you look at the tools real quick, I have a 55 present, 60 future on the hit, 50 mm-hmm. present raw power, 55 future, and the game power is about 50. Uh, I think it's just above average tools across the board, which is I love those types of players. So a guy that is consistently either an all-star reserve or somebody that's like, hey, Evan Carter should have gotten more love. Yeah, 100 percent of it. Um, all right. Look at Dominguez, man. Uh done for the year, torn UCL, Tommy John surgery likely required. The good news is he is a hitter. Um, yeah. So, you know, we've been talking about Tommy John all the time with pitchers, and that's, you know, 18 months, or I guess 14 to 16. Um, with hitters, the example that I think Pass cited was Harper came back at five as a DH, which was record-breaking quick. Otani came back at six as a DH, but he was careful because he had to pitch. Dominguez, it's going it's going to be like six to seven months. If you get it done now, like if you get it done on September 14th, if you get it done this week, you're probably looking at a guy that's going to miss half a spring training entirely, works his way back, and he's probably back up with the Yankees on May 1 to May 10, probably yeah. around that timeline. Yeah. I, I can and, live with you know, that. It, it, yeah, it, 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 the good news is it's not pitcher Tommy John situation, right? Yeah. Like, like you said, which, I mean, that would have been devastating. Kid kid comes up, so exciting, looks like the future, looks like a big part of what they're doing. And then, unfortunately, and we call him the Martian, and maybe the most human thing possible happens to him, which is he tears his UCL, just like every other human who plays the sport of baseball. Like you said, it's gonna be he's going to come back relatively quick compared to pitchers. What stinks, though, is... Dominguez's arm is a big part of why he's so valuable offensively. So we know guys come back from Tommy John, but this is a dude that likes to let it rip. And it's a little different for him because I think he's going to come back. Maybe they DH him a little bit, but you don't want to do that because you have Stanton. So that's the other side of it is you're not going to really be able to DH Dominguez that much. And Dominguez, when he comes back, He's not going to guard that arm. Like, it'll be weird to try to have him guard that arm. It's a plus-plus arm. And if you think about the force that's being kind of applied when you have 100-mile-per-hour you know, throws from the outfield like Dominguez is capable of, they may tread a little bit more lightly. So I'm interested to see how they handle that with with the DH role kind of clogged and him being somebody that really likes to cut loose. Um, And that's probably part of the reason why he – I don't know how he tore his UCL or what the exact breakdown of it is, but – I mean, I know that this dude uncorks some special throws from the outfield. So I'm interested to see how they handle it because you're looking at a 20 year old here. You don't want to re injure it and have him out even longer. Um, but of course, this is a guy that's going to be a big part of your team next year and beyond, and probably is your everyday center fielder next year. So it, it's, it's a weird spot for the Yankees to be. I imagine they get some insurance policy or just do the classic play judge and center uh, whenever we, we need somebody to fill in. But it sucks because Dominguez was so much fun. And we were talking about how the Yankees have just been so much more fun to watch with the young guys there. And and, and Dominguez was a big part of that. So you just got me thinking, and I did a quick scroll of spot track. Is Stanton the biggest ball and chain in baseball right now? Like we're going to talk about Strasburg to wrap the show, yeah. but Giancarlo yeah. Stanton, like, okay, Corbin, but Corbin's deal is almost up. They're paying Stanton at least 25 a year. He's making 32 next year. 32 is a 35 year old in 2025, 29 million in 2026, and 25 million in 2027. They've got a club option at 25 when he's 38 years old in 2028. 
This guy's going absolutely nowhere. No one wants to take that thing on. His sprint speed might be like he doesn't sprint. He doesn't sprint. We don't know what his sprint speed is, but like his jog speed is the worst thing you've ever seen from a professional baseball player, especially someone that still looks like they can be in like the Sports Illustrated body edition. So it, it's so hard for me to say, well, Dominguez can DH, but that's Stanton's spot. Come yeah. on. Come on. Do? It's so do? hampering. I don't know. And, you know, you talk bad business decisions all the time. At the time, it looked like a great get. And, it still can be a great get, I guess, because Stanton, yes, he can go on this crazy run where he hits 20 homers in two months. That's still in there, I feel like. Yeah. But it's just, it's becoming a farther and farther reach. And the fact that we're not going to be able to see Dominguez, who has lit the baseball world on fire. If yeah. Baseball's not getting, like, one individual this year is not getting the pub like Dominguez, aside from Ellie De La Cruz. It was Ellie Manning at the beginning. And now it's Dominguez and everybody, whenever he went yard, I got five texts that just had like yeah. the, the alien emoji, like Martian, yeah. man. Yeah. I, it's fun. It sucks, but I don't want to see an old ailing half-assing Giancarlo Stanton hindering the Martians ability to return next year. I know. I know. And that's the interesting part. I don't know what they're going to do because it's not like you can put him in the outfield either. <laughs> I mean, he can barely move out there and it's so hard to see, man, because I know Stanton wants to 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 hustle. I know he does because I watched that guy put the burners on for years in Miami. He was fast. He was legitimately fast. And, and I don't think people realize that. Like, there's probably so many Yankees fans out there that have no idea how fast John Carlos Stanton used to be uh, and Mike Stanton when he came up with the Marlins. And yeah. it's just he can't. He it, it, I'm pretty sure, and I'm, I'd be shocked if this wasn't the case. I'm I'm sure trainers are telling him like just jog it, man. Like it's not worth it yeah. because of how, how much his body just continues to fail him. And then you look at the hitting side of it. It's a high effort swing. And when you have a high effort swing like that and your body's not where it used to be, you're just not going to catch up to shit the way you used to. And that's exactly what's happening. He's just whiffing more and he's just not catching up. And it's really, really, really hard to watch because I, as far as I'm concerned, Giancarlo Stanton, one of the, one of the good guys yeah, in, in terms yeah. of just, he never was an issue in Miami, was always well liked there, goes to New York, even through the struggles, the good, the bad, whatever. Never an issue with New York media. I was curious how he was going to adjust and, you know, going from pretty much the least covered team in baseball to, to New York. And he's been nothing but, you know, accountable and I think very good in the clubhouse there. And every, every one of his teammates likes him. I know that that's not worth $300 million, but that's where the Marlins didn't get much for him in return. That was even after he had recently won the MVP. People were wary of the contract. So I mean, this is kind of what many teams were afraid of when the Marlins were shopping him was, how is it going to look when he's 33? Maybe they were more worried about when he's 35 and this came around a little bit quicker, but this was a big reason why uh, the Marlins essentially made their best asset, one of their least valuable by giving him this contract. And that was Jeffrey Loria, who knew he was going to sell the team giving yeah. out a contract that he knew he never was going to pay. And that's why it's so backloaded. Uh, it, it's tough. It's it's a really bad spot for the Yankees to be. It absolutely handcuffs them. And I don't really see a way that they move off of this unless we see some galaxy brain, massive Mike Trout deal where this is sent the other way. Because Mike Trout, let's be honest, that contract, like it's Mike Trout. So you, you take a chance, but that contract could age really horribly with all of the issues and ailments that he has. Uh, and, and as his body might start to, to fail him a little bit, remember, he's not 33 yet. Yeah. That could be a swap of contracts, less years owed, and the Yankees add a shit ton of value and prospects on top of that. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard to find a way to to offset this this money. And I think they're going to have to just eat it for, for a long time. Yeah, I mean, Trout made 35 this year. He hasn't been worth 35 this year. Who's to say that he's going to no. be worth 35 next year? He's owed 35.45 every year through 2030 his age 38 season that could be <laughs> that could be abysmal but it's mike trout like you said so it's hard to you know forecast and say like hey the stanton deal sucks but the trout deal is gonna really suck even though we're talking about a guy that yeah. if he retired today is still a hall of famer um real quick before we get into uh steven strasberg before we get into the marlins taking two from philly and yoshinobu yamamoto 
Fantasy football is here. We all run into this issue. You think your squad is better than your buddies, but you're not in the same league. So how can you take home bragging rights? Your solution is Verse Gaming. Their unique platform allows you and your friends to sync your fantasy football team directly from ESPN, Yahoo, or Sleeper and play head-to-head matchups against league mates. Even better, Verse can formulate gambling lines for your specific matchup. So if I'm playing you, Aram, on Verse, I can bet that I'll cover plus four and a half against you because I know you have Tua and I've got Trevor Lawrence. (laughs) Verse is introducing a brand new element to fantasy sports. Just download the Verse Fantasy Sports app. And in just a few taps, you can start putting money down on your head-to-head matchups. Once you're signed up, you get a $20 referral bonus if you get your friends to sign up. And even better, they'll receive $50 in promo for using your code. Verse available in 23 states, including California, Florida, Texas, New York, and Chicago land, which is where Arm is right now. For more information, visit versegaming.com or find them on your favorite social media platform at Verse Fantasy, V-E-R-S-E Fantasy. Verse Fantasy, you want in? Sir? I love it. Um, Okay, let's jump to the Marlins, taking two of three from Philly. And you mentioned it. Who were the starting pitchers in this one? <laughs> it was uh well you had you had in games two and three, I believe it was Johnny Cueto. That was an L, but they hung around. And then they started Stephen O'Kurt on their way to a, a bullpen game in game three. So they had Yuri in, in game one who held it down, you know, dodged a couple almost home runs that went foul and gave them a decent outing and, and they pulled that win out. But to me, that that was a big statement because you could you could claim two wins by you surprise the Dodgers, you sneak two wins at home, getting them on the road, long road trip, but to then follow that up by going on the road to Philly and taking two out of three there after the Sandy Alcantara news, right? The Sandy Alcantara news comes out right in the middle of that Dodger series, and they come out and and just boat race the Dodgers that game. They take the two out of three there, and then to take. The, the series in Philly, I I don't know. I, I, you know how like careful I've been in terms of buying into this team. Yeah. And I know the Sandy news really sucks and hurts their outlook. But based on the performance of this week now, I mean, every game matters so much more as, as we wind down at September 11th, as, as we're going to put this episode out. Like we're, we're far along here. There's not that many games left. I'm starting to believe in this Marlins team a little bit, man. They're five games over. There were guys, and I was start, I want to start with the Yuri start because Yuri Perez, it was five innings of two-run ball. Christopher Sanchez went five shutout innings in counter to him. But there were two home runs in that one. And the thing that kind of gets me about the Marlins is this weekend they won a series because of guys that were like the butt of jokes at the beginning of this year, maybe even the first couple months of this year. Jesus Sanchez last year, it was like borderline hilarious how lost that guy looked at points. He hits a two-run bomb off Sir Anthony Dominguez, of all people. And then Jacob Stallings has a massive swing. (laughs) Stallings is still the butt of jokes, even after that home run. So that's how they win game one. They win game three. Guess who looked awesome? Well, he didn't look awesome, but guess who got the out when he needed? David Robertson got the outs when he needed. Yes, he walked two. Yes, he loaded the bases. But he struck out three in his inning, and he looked fired up when, like, every interview he's done since before oh coming to Miami and coming to Miami, it seems like he's not fired up to be in Miami. So I, I can appreciate that it's those three guys that were, like, I don't know, like, joke-esque players at certain yeah. points in their Marlins career propelling them to a series win. And Tanner Scott, dude, Tanner oh my God, thank might you just for be one of the better relievers in baseball. Yeah. I, it's unbelievable to watch. This was a guy that also we were joking about last year, not because he was a bad reliever. Like he was a fine lefty punch out guy that you got to take the good with the bad, but the Marlins, I mean, Don Mattingly was rolling him out there last year. Like he was Josh Hader. He was closing yeah. every game, no matter what. I think he was blowing half of them and he's just been a different guy this year. And yes, it wasn't as a closer to start the year, but he was getting put in every horrible situation. Like he was the get me out of this jam kind of guy and he was doing it better than anybody now they need somebody to close ball games out and now he's been a, a nails closer for them going multi-inning saves going you know in some of the highest leverage spots against really good teams 
he's been one of the best relievers in baseball flat out this year. And it's been so much fun to watch. I, it, it's this team has just been unbelievable to me. It, it's it's really funny. Every time I think they're going to fade, you know, I thought maybe after they didn't get any of those additions in the uh, in the waiver period, that might be where they start to fade. I thought maybe with this absolute ringer of a schedule they have, which they could still fade coming up. They got the Brewers and then they've got the Mets, but then I think they've got the Brewers again. I think the Braves are mixed in there. Like they, they've got a ringer of a schedule the rest of the way. But, I mean, everybody is stepping up. And you mentioned the comebacks. They come back against Sir Anthony Dominguez. They were losing in that game by multiple runs. They come back in game three of the series where they were getting no hit through, like, six innings. And they come back in that one and overcome a three-run deficit. That's the other side of it, too, is, like, this team is that that has an offense that's kind of middling. Just feels like they're never, ever out of it. And, by the way, Tanner Scott of Qualified Relievers, second in Major League Baseball in F4 behind only Felix Bautista. And I like F4 when you're looking at reliever value here because, you know, we can compare middle reliever or, or I guess, setup guys and, and higher leverage guys and whatever. And guys that are used more may have a better F4 because it's a cumulative stat. You know, of course, Felix Bautista, 1480 RA, uh, and, and he's a full tick above everybody else, or like a David Bednar, 195 ERA. But you have a, a two three from Tanner Scott, but he's pitched in high leverage spots. He's thrown more innings and, and has more appearances than just about everybody. It's part of the reason why he's been one of the most valuable guys in, in baseball out of the bullpen. So it's been fun to watch. I think I think I'm, I'm bought in enough to feel like they're going to hang around and, and make some noise. Well, so that war leaderboard, that F4 leaderboard, if I'm not mistaken, it's Bautista by a wide margin. It's like 2.8 to 2.3 or 2.2. Yep. Yeah. So Bautista, closer exclusive, like ninth inning guy. That's what he was doing. Scott, kind of a Swiss Army knife this year. He's like taken over that yes. closer role since Puck has, you know, shit hit the fan after the All-Star break. But then after that, I mean, I, I know Bednar's right there. That is closer exclusive. Matt Brash is a setup guy. Brash yeah. is up there when it comes to F4. The other one that I want to point to here is win probability added. And that is the leverage number. Alexis Diaz and Felix Bautista tied at one, 4.22. Tanner Scott's three. And then you've got yeah. Chris Martin out of nowhere. Chris Martin kind of hilarious in that Red Sox bullpen. He's good this year. And then you've got Devin Williams, five. Tanner Scott's just one of the best. It, it, there's yeah. no way to look past that. Another one, I'm fully convinced that Brian De La Cruz is a is a good Major League Baseball player. He went yard on Sunday. Like, he's, he's fun. He's a great interview. I love seeing the social stuff so- the Marlins do with him. He's funny. Um, but man, like that was his 19th homer this year. I think that this guy can absolutely be a slightly above average OPS guy play decent outfield. Yeah. That's the part that that's the part that drives me nuts. The defense is sometimes it looks like he looks better than, than he is. And the range and the arm is so, and that's the part that holds him back F4 wise. Cause I agree. Like he could be a really solid, consistent bat. If he can make some progress with the defense this off season, I think he can be consistently like a two, two and a half win player, which you need those guys. And yeah. by the way, they're doing this with Soler out, by the way. Like, mm-hmm. that's the other big, big part of this as well. Like, we talk about Sandy, but no, like, Soler goes out and you have De La Cruz step up. And every time I think De La Cruz is going to, like, hit a wall, you mention it. Like, he comes up clutch with a big home run and he just, he runs into baseballs. And same thing with Jesus Sanchez. Same thing with this entire team. It's it's just been wild to watch. And I think I'm bought in. Like, I just think they're going to hang in and, and make some noise. And the bullpen's been so solid all of a sudden it's it's just hard to to count these guys out especially the way that they're able to come back late in ball games i think i'm on the bandwagon with you you're not on the bandwagon like you you christian crespo and ethan badowski have every right to be there um but i do believe the white Sox are officially eliminated from postseason contention as of <laughs> they, sunday they they they're done officially they're officially done. eliminated yeah. um i was off that wagon by the all-star break um, yeah. Cubs and Marlins call me Ethan Badowski, our social gem. Oh my God. He's going to, right I think he's going to lose his mind if, if that's the matchup, but it should be pretty fun. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the kind of final race here. You got the reds with some reinforcements now coming back as well. Uh, some guys off the injured list, Hunter green being back in the fold. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a fun little showdown the rest of the way. And, and the D backs, I mean, they look good though. I mean, they, they're starting to show some signs of life again and have been playing a lot better over the last 10. 
I thought they were they looked good and, and matched the energy that, that we saw at Wrigley. Gordis Gurriel put on a, a defensive master class in left field, which I've never seen from him before, too, by the way. It was fun to see. It, it's it's playoff atmosphere now, which is which is awesome. I can't tell you the last time I've seen the Marlins play meaningful games in September outside of the Mickey Mouse season. It's yeah. it, it really hasn't been since 2009. And and that I mean, that's a long time ago. Did Sixto start game one or game two in 2020? In that wild card series, was it game two? Did Sandy? Start I think it was game, game two. He started game two. He's in Pensacola now. That's kind of exciting. That's unbelievable. I, I never, I didn't think he'd throw a, a pitch from a mound in, in an actual game for the Marlins again. I, I yeah, genuinely, you got to go fly down to Pensacola. You just got to like touch him on the shoulder, and it's like you're real. Oh God, dude! I thought, I thought once, once my buddy Griff got promoted from there, I'd never go back. <laughs> but no, if, back. I might have to go back. I might have to go back to, to for six though. I might have to. Yeah. Um. All right. Let's let's talk Yoshinobu Yamamoto right now. Yeah. And, and this guy, Roki Sasaki, is the buzz name over in Japan right now. I think the two are Sasaki and Munataka Murakami because those were the the wonderkins that we were talking about. But uh, Yamamoto, man, like he's a he's coming over sooner. He's coming over this year. And B, in terms of recognition and awards and overall statistics. He's been arguably better than Roki Sasaki on the hill in the NPB. Now, Sasaki's 21 years old, and Sasaki, by the way, just returned from an oblique issue and held him out, I think, a month. Mm -hmm. But Yamamoto, his second no-hitter in a year in change. He did this with Brian Cashman sitting front row behind Mm -hmm. home plate. There were other executives from other teams there. Don't get it twisted. But Cashman was an easy ID, bald head, Mm -hmm. you know, thick frame glasses. Yamamoto this year is 14 and five with a one, two, six ERA, 145 punch outs, 24 walks in 143 innings of work. Again, he's 25 years old. He's going to be posted this off season. So we can get into the stuff. And I know that you're going to dive into the pitch by pitch, what they look like in a vacuum, but I'll make my sweeping claim to start and you can kind of back up why I think he is the second highest paid pitcher this off season. Yeah, I still and, would have put him two, I think, ahead of Julio Urias based on this year. And obviously now the Urias conversation is is a moot point. I think Nola does get paid more than Yamamoto. And I, I know that you could make the counter argument here, but I think that Yamamoto is an 150 plus million dollar pitcher this offseason. Yeah, it's it's really hard to put the numbers out there because you see like what Kodai Sanga got and you look at it like there's two ways you can look at it. Kodai saying, oh, was it 75 million that Sanga got? Five for 75. Yeah, you, you will get it two different ways. One way could be, hey, that's kind of a good barometer. He's going to get a little bit more than that or whatever, maybe, or, or a, still like a, a third more than that, whatever it may be. But you could also look at it the other way where it's like people thought that was a bargain. And now it already looks like a massive bargain in terms of how he's pitched. And maybe that inspires people to, you know, teams to be a little bit more aggressive with the the numbers that they're willing to throw out because well, let's be honest if teams could have a, a do-over on the Kodai Sanga sweepstakes somebody's coming in at 100 million now I, I, I'm, I'm fairly positive at least somebody's beaten 75 so yeah. I, I'm interested I do agree I think he's a 150 million dollar pitcher does he get that we'll see because I was surprised that Sanga only got 75 from what I had seen from the, the dives that I'd done and, and the data that I'd looked into and and the numbers that he had. But of course, there's the questions of the baseballs are different. How are they going to throw with a big league ball? And there's plenty of, of fair questions about that. Sanga being older though, and Yamamoto having turned 25 less than a month ago, gives me even more, uh, I think, confidence that I can give a longer term deal and, and some more money to this guy. Uh, because even if he has an injury at some point in the middle of it, like he's young, you know, you feel better about his, his ability to get back, less miles on that arm. I think when you look at Yamamoto, though, man, I know you said before we hit record, and, and it's a fair point because you know what you're getting. And again, you, you don't always know what you're getting as guys make the the jump over. There's yeah. beyond just the the change in baseball and the level of competition. There's a psychological side of it. It's it's a lot to handle. Not only just going to the other side of the world and and pitching in you know a country where no one speaks your language, but also being a big money, big ticket free agent on top of that. So there's a lot of variance to this where Aaron Nola is just like, I go out there and I pitch. That's the most like that that guy, I think you could give him a billion dollars and I don't think the game changes for him. No. So I get it from that perspective. But if I'm a GM in terms of upside, I think I'd rather give the check to Yamamoto. 
upside higher for Yamamoto, but I'm just, I'm, I'm risk averse. And we, I, I think that's been maybe more well-documented than anything on this podcast. I'm, I'm looking at Nolan. I'm like, you're going to get 190 to 220 innings every single year. And it's and some, probably going to be in the high threes. And some team's going to say, Hey, we can tweak, we can tweak that arsenal. Like we talked about with, with, with pitching ninja. Some, every team thinks that they can unlock something. Someone's going to look at him, say that they can unlock something and and say, let's, let's give him the money. Let's make it happen. So. And the only team that can truly unlock things is Tampa. I, yeah. The Robert Stevenson point that I think I made it on the pod at the end of last week, but Lance Brzezdowski, who was a great conversation on the show. Um, I mean, like Stevenson had a negative fit there for his last like 10 appearances. They, they work. They've got some sort of like satanic agreement right now. Yeah. Um, but other than that, man, like obviously the Dodgers do it too, but it's Tampa, like, I don't know if Nola signs with I, the Rays. Wh- yeah, why not? If Nola the signs with the Rays, then he's he's Tom Seaver. We know that. I know. I know that the Rays have, and well, I'm going to get into Yamamoto's arsenal in a second, yeah. but I just want to put this out there, and we'll talk about this so much in the off season. I know the Rays have a, a rotation that could be fairly loaded next year, but you know that they're probably not going to give Glass now a long term deal. You know that there's a lot of questions about the health of a lot of those guys in return. You don't know what Rasmussen's going to look like. You don't know. If Springs is going to be back at at what point next year? There's and Boz will see, you know how how he comes back. Like, there's and a McClanahan's lot of going to miss the whole year. Yeah, and Nola yeah. is the one thing that they don't have, which is durable. And I wonder if if Nola and Eflin still talk at all. And Eflin would say, "Come on over here, man! Like yeah. they got me right. Like they got me right." So the Rays look. They spend in certain spots. They're already having conversations about a stadium and they're finally making some progress on that, which is so exciting because I just saw Julio Rodriguez hit the third ring again in that stadium. I'm going to lose my fucking mind. Like it's just insane that a stadium can obstruct play so frequently. Yeah. Uh, that would be huge for the fi- financial aspect. We know that the Rays offered Freddie Freeman a lot of money in the right spots. They'll, they'll cough it up and maybe they will be a little bit more you know, willing to do so here and then make a trade elsewhere. Cause I mean, they're pretty loaded lineup wise. So I'm interested to see what they do, but I think Nola makes a lot of sense there. Real quick on Yamamoto's arsenal. Yeah. You mentioned the numbers this year and how disgusting he's been. What I really like about him, you, you compare him to like a Kodai Sanga or or some of these other guys. He's got a he's got an ability to to spin it a little bit better. We talked about how some guys are supinators, which is you know going to be more of that snap the breaking ball versus pronators, who are going to be more the other way, which is like that that change up or being able to throw the splitter. Which I think that doesn't you don't need to be as much of a pronator for that, of course. But he can kind of do both. The splitter is disgusting. Similar metrics to what you get from Kodai Sanga. The fastball sits 97, touches 100 quite frequently. And then you also have a cutter that is really effective, a slider that's really effective, and this taste-breaking curveball, all at different speeds. Fastball's upper 90s, splitter's low 90s, cutter's low 90s to mid 90s, slider's low to mid 80s, and then the curveball's upper 70s. That's why this guy throws no hitters. And because he can give you different looks each time through the lineup with Sanga, it's going to be the ghost fork. And when the ghost forks there, he can tell you it's coming. He can give you the glove gesture and throw it. And he's going to be nasty. But that said, if that pitch isn't there, he might not always have his best night with Yamamoto. He can just come at you in so many different ways on top of the diabolical splitter that he can change his looks first time through second time through third time through. And that's what I think is going to make him so consistently good when he does come over to the big leagues. So there is like a comp and I don't think it's Senga based on production, based on age, it's Tanaka Masahiro Tanaka ahead of, I think 2015 signed or ahead of 2014 signed seven years, $155 million with the Yankees. And that was kind of like unheard of money, but Tanaka was so good for so long. And he had just finished his age 24 season in Japan. And this guy was consistently putting up an ERA in the low twos or the high ones, he was about nine Ks per nine, and he was about a walk and a half per nine. Yoshinobu Yamamoto debuted in NPB at 18 years old. He's finishing his age 24 season right now. And his career numbers in the NPB, a 1.84 ERA, 9.2 Ks per nine, two walks per nine. From a statistical standpoint, it's almost identical. And that is why I think those contracts are going to be almost identical. I think seven for 155 is the starting point. And I think Yamamoto says, 
we've got to elevate because 2024's market is not 2015's market. And he may be closer to 200 than 150. Yeah. Yeah. Sanga I'm, doesn't I'm, have this pedigree. Yamamoto's got this pedigree. And and a little bit more youth on his side. I I, and, I don't disagree. And by the way, just wait till Sasaki comes over because he's going to look at what Yamamoto gets and says, like, you fucking double it, Bubba. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As long as he's healthy, man, it's blank check season for Roki. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's it's interesting, man. And and I love the point there because I've talked to a ton of pitchers that are like, I supinate or I pronate. I don't do both. <laughs> like the, yeah. the, the ones that do do both are alien life forms. Mm-hmm. Like McClanahan was doing both with that split change and with that breaking ball. And that's why he was the best pitcher on earth before he got TJ. Yeah. The split's almost like the hack because you don't have to, to pronate, right? You can yeah. just kind of grip just it and let the grip take care of it and throw the shit out of it. And, you know, a lot of these guys in that come over from the MPB or, or come over from the KBO or whatever it may be, like, you don't even know if they're really pronators or supinators because they've got the fork ball and then, or, and then they just, they just absolutely rip the fastballs by you. But certain guys just have a better feel for, for, for spin. And, you know, Sanga's not the best. He has a cutter, which again, that's kind of one of those pitches that the grip takes care of it. It's had a great run value this year. Uh, but I think some of the expected sets aren't as good. It's different with, with Yamamoto. Like he's throwing sweepers and, and, and he's getting you like that. That's a pitch that, for him is, is a separator, I think, from some of the other guys that have that that splitter fork ball type, uh, but yeah. don't have as much of the the horizontal break on other pitches. So I think there is a Senga equivalent real quick, and it's Shota Imanaga, the left-hander who like last week they said is posted. He's probably a step yeah. below Kodai Senga, yeah, but I would say a step below. So over the last couple of years, Imanaga in 2021 had a 283 ERA. It was eight and a half Ks per nine, two walks per nine. 2022, sorry, 21. It was eight and a half Ks per nine, two walks per nine, and a 283. 2022, he had a 204 ERA, eight and a half Ks per nine, under two walks per nine. And this year, in 139 innings, he's got a 265 ERA, 166 punch outs, and 21 walks. So that's 10 and a half Ks per nine, one and a half walks per nine. So he's putting together his best year. He's more of a strikeout artist than Yamamoto is just by the counting numbers themselves. Um, but Imanaga is kind of going to come over. If Senga signed five for 75, you assume five for 60 for Imanaga? Yeah, I'm curious to see what he gets because he, he doesn't have, I mean, as, as good as stuff as the other guys, but he just kind of plays up and he's a lefty and it's a low release point and he just he gets a weird amount of lifts on his fastball. So I'm curious. That's That's a guy that I could see being shockingly cheap or getting something close to that. I think there's going to be a wide range there, but I think he's one of the safer arms. You know, at the very least, that guy comes over and he's a five for you. I, yeah. I, I think you can say that with a fair level of confidence. Uh, but I, I think you might be surprised at how how cheap he might be because of the, how how he's older and smaller guy and doesn't throw super hard. Uh, but it'll be fascinating to see. I, I think he's he's an underrated arm, especially in a market that's going to be very thin and just got a little bit thinner, especially from the left side. Super thin. Um, Shohei Otani and the Angels go to Seattle this week. They start tonight. Fun thing from uh, a member of Art Just Baseball Network, the Marine Layer Pod, uh, Lyle yeah. Goldstein, TJ Matthewson. What they're doing is they are printing business cards <laughs> and they are handing them out. And it's almost orchestrating chants. Like you see the sheet that Duke basketball prints out at Cameron Indoor for the student section. And it's like, hey, here's some personal dirt on each guy. Instead of that, it's encouragement. It's, hey, pass these cards out around the ballpark. And we're going to get the come to Seattle chance going for Shohei Otani all week. And they're yeah. saying this is our audition for Shohei Otani now. Yeah. And and the Otani, I think it was pre-All-Star break and during the All-Star game when Otani was getting those come to Seattle chants. If they can do that for a three-game stretch, I I think it would be a great landing spot. And I love that our guys are are taking that initiative. It's it's so awesome. I think it's so much fun. They're turning into one of the and not just saying they're on our network. Like they're turning into one of the the best. I think team pods covering the Mariners out there, and and they've they're credentialed. They're talking to these guys pretty much every single day that they're, that they're home in Seattle. Yeah. And I mean, they do a great job on the show. But I don't know if you you see many people that that have that much passion and and I think are putting that much effort into it as well. But when I, I started thinking about it, when I saw what they were doing and trying to orchestrate there in Seattle, and I'm like, it really is a perfect fit. You know, he's not going to throw for a little bit. They don't need him to. There's no rush. Uh, When he is ready, then maybe you move one of your controllable arms at that point and you don't have to worry about it. But until then, 
put him in the DH spot. He's going to crush balls and you'll be fine with that. If there's a team that can probably say, take your sweet damn time when it comes to returning to the mound, it's the Mariners. And then once he comes back, all right, you, you find a spot for him by trading, you know, a Wu or a Miller or whatever and turning that into another bat for you. Yeah. Uh, it, it it would be the perfect landing spot. He wants to win. And that's a team that I, I think, yes, they've had a long time, a long playoff drought that they recently snapped. But I think you look at the Mariners franchise and you have to see the direction. You have a conversation with Jerry Depoto. I think if you're, if you're Shohei Otani, you probably come away encouraged. You see yeah. the farm system just quickly reloading. You see what they're able to build here. You see the young talent and the, the controllable rotation. And I think you've got to feel like, hey, this is a great landing spot. You get to stay on the West Coast, which he said he doesn't have to, but I'm sure that's relatively preferred. Yeah. It seems like maybe the perfect landing spot for him if they've if they've got the coin. I love it. And if he wants to pivot to this relief role, you know he's got to throw the seventh, eighth, and ninth every fifth day because Kirby can only go six. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, I forgot we should we should have added that to the docket. Lapse in judgment from George Kirby. That was a really bad claim. 90 pitches through six. Uh, it was what, a two run shot against him in the seventh on his 101st pitch of the night. And in his post game uh, media scrum, he said, yeah, I wish I wasn't out there for the seventh inning. And that's a really hard thing to stomach, either as a Mariners fan or be as a baseball fan, because yeah. you want your pitcher to be a horse. And it's like, I want the fucking ball. Give me the ball. Kirby it clearly didn't want the ball for the seventh. And he made that known. He was expressing frustration that's really not a good way to do it. I thought that was a big time brain fart. He apologized for it. Um, but man, that was a bad look. I think the backlash was kind of eyewash too, with so many people citing. It, I, and it, you, I think you quote tweeted Clemens. Yeah, I did quote see Clemens. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, well, you know, it, it's easier to to go deep in games consistently when, when you, you get a needle in your ass, but <laughs> I, that's besides the point. Also, I know I'm supposed to say, Oh, well, he threw complete games in the eighties. Okay, fine. Whatever. Like it, it's besides the point. Like it's still a guy that, that used a competitive advantage to be able to continue to, to be durable. Like if it was so easy to go deep into games, why'd he do it? Uh, but anyways, um, I, I thought Clemens had one of the better replies from all of the, the veterans that I saw. So first I'll start with this. My first reaction to that was, this is a brutal, brutal quote from Kirby. I love him as a pitcher. I think he's going to be a really good player for a long time. Tough look. 100%. And you can you can say, hey, he's frustrated and he was venting it out. And I think that's 100% what it was because this is one of the roughest stretches of his career. And he hasn't really faced that much adversity because he's just been so good and so consistent that, you know, it came out the wrong way. He wears his heart on his sleeve. I saw Ryan Devish said, you know, who covers the Mariners as, as well as anybody on the beat. Yeah. This is a guy that really wears his heart on his sleeve and takes losses and struggles as hard as anybody. And when you cover a team like that and you're in the clubhouse, you see that. And he clearly didn't want to be talking to the media at that point. And I think he let something out that, you know, a 25 year old probably wishes he could have back. And you don't burn your manager like that. You should want that ball pride out of your hand. And and we all know that that's how the majority of pitchers feel. And George Kirby threw a complete game three weeks ago against the best team in the American League in, in, in the Baltimore Orioles. So it's it's not like he's he's averse to doing it. And that's where I got really annoyed. And it almost brought me back around full circle. Where I'm like, I can't believe I'm now defending George Kirby because I hated the, the comment. And I think he already regrets it and he apologized and Scott service still kind of dunked on him after it. And he said, he apologized, but he, he knows what, whatever it was like the most dad energy ever. Yeah. That said, some of the quotes that we're getting from like Mark Mulder, like Jared Weaver, and like all of the, the, just the classic, I'm sure David Wells chimed in there, by the way, taped over the Nike logo. Oh on, on. dude. And went on a <laughs> the, the, Bud Light rampage. Oh that was just God. bizarre. Oh my God. <laughs> Old timers day is just a tough look. <laughs> oh, oh God. The taping over the Nike logo was something else. Like, I don't care. I I'm never going to talk about politics, things like that. I don't care, right. but that's just like, that's, that was the wildest, the wildest thing I've seen. But, but anyway. also like, how does Bud Light come up at Old Timers Day? Yeah. Like that was just the well, He started getting into the pitch clock and I'm like, well, I wonder why he wouldn't like the pitch clock. But anyways, I feel like it just became this teeing off session for, for all the old heads. And, and I, I love the old, like I've learned some of the more important things I know about baseball from conversations that I've had from players from the eighties and the nineties that I've been fortunate enough to, to talk to. And I mean, th there's so much that is wrong with the game in terms of, of where it's gone in some ways, but using that as an example of like, Oh, this is what analytics have done to kids. Like this is what analytics are telling. 
99% of these pitchers should find me one other instance where a pitcher said, I wish I wasn't out there. I don't even think Blake Snell would say that. So it's one of those things where it's like, I get where they're coming from because the analytics say third time through the lineup, you don't want to be out there and pitchers are kind of being conditioned to go five, six innings, but no, but no pitcher in today's game. That's at 90 pitches other than this one off with George Kirby is saying, Oh, because of the analytics, I don't want to be out there in the seventh. All these guys want to fucking be out there and spare me that using that as an, as an excuse to just dunk on, on young players today and say, this is the new mentality that these guys have. No, they fucking don't. Majority of these guys don't. And that's where it was really annoying to me. I'm like, we're really going to do this. And also defining George Kirby by one emotional quote is also ridiculous. They're calling him, you know, plenty of names that can be put in in line with what some men's men like to interpret as that soft, right? What's the explicit version I can give you of that? I think you can put it together. Just bizarre stuff. Just bizarre stuff. It's so weird. Also, I I think you hit the nail on the head with, quote analytics being the most scapegoat buzzword in all of sports it, it, here's here's what the analytics say about kirby um they say what they say about pretty much every pitcher third time through the order and at diminished velocity he may be hit harder was that not the case in the 1960s when you saw a guy like oh whitey ford looks tired maybe we should take him out of the game oh my god is that they, analytics? No, that's our bullpen sucks ass because no one cared about bullpens back then. So you're going to ride a tired. And now you've forward. got six guys throwing a hundred from both sides. And then you've got Howie Rose citing Sandy Koufax who threw with, he called it elbow arthritis, which there's been so many doctors out there that have said pretty much I can hypothesize that it was a UCL tear. Like what is your elbow arthritis? Also Sandy Koufax threw two games through elbow arthritis in the world series, whatever. Sandy Koufax, famously long career, right? Like, I, I just, again, I don't, I don't understand that. Like, it's, it's weird to me how we start to compare these apples to oranges. But just, just to wrap a bow on that, on that part of it, like, yeah, every pitcher in the history of time has been worse third time through the order, uh, aside from like very, 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 very few. And it's worth noting that George Kirby actually has a two-two ERA through innings seven through nine this year. Yes, his numbers third, two, third time through the lineup aren't great because he pounds the strike zone. And he's not a guy that's going to go stuff over command. Yeah. And it's funny, like if there's one guy that the old head should like in terms of how he pitches, it's it should be George Kirby. They liked him before that quote. They loved they, him yeah. before that quote because it didn't was a bad anymore. quote. It was a bad quote. It was a, it was an objectively bad quote. It doesn't define who he is. I hated it. It, it really. Frustrated. But again, he owned it. He apologized. Why are we defining him as a man now? Be at 25 years old because he was upset about how he performed and lashed out people lash out all the time and that that part was ridiculous no man you or i have never said stupid shit before yeah when i'm when yeah i mean i do it on the podcast when i get it i'm doing it right now Uh, (laughs) but it's just yeah seeing the mark molders of the world and the jared weavers who i respect they've accomplished and forgotten more about baseball than i know but you also have to embrace change and embrace like that not everything is old school versus new school ways that's just that's just an angry guy lashing out that doesn't epitomize the 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 gist of mental the mental approach of pitchers today like it just doesn't for sure all right um as we wrap give me the 811 on steven strasburg like how do you contextualize this strasburg nationals thing there was supposed to be a retirement ceremony his family came in I guess there was an agreement that they were going to pay strasburg the remainder of the contract if he retired then the nats rebuked that um, or yeah, pulled back, rebuffed. I think rebuffed is the right one. I, I don't know. Like, what am I missing here? Can I just read the national statement? Yeah. So by the way, uh, apparently, according to John Heyman, Strasburg's family was was in town for this jersey retirement or for just for his retirement ceremony. I don't know if they were retiring his jersey or what they were doing there. Yeah. But more importantly, he was getting the money no matter what. It, that's how it works. I, I, it's a horrible contract and it sucks for the nationals. It does. They gave it to him. They didn't insure it. I don't know why they didn't insure it given his injury history. They knew his injury history. We've talked about that. Like they kind of knew what they were potentially signing up for, but it was the classic. So Pablo Sandoval, like, Oh, we just won the world series on his back. Like let's give him the blank check and that right off into the sunset. We're riding high. And that, that, that was the classic move that they made there. But 
Now I think all of a sudden, and they're undergoing a lot of overhaul in the system, by the way. They've they've let go of, I think, over a dozen scouts, like long-term scouts that they've had. They've still been nickel and diming back and forth with Rizzo, their general manager, who you know, they've made it very clear they want to keep around. Uh, they've been – the team was going to be for sale. Now it's not. They've got issues with their TV deal and and being able to – actually fulfill that side of things. And, and that's not all their fault. That's obviously across the board in the league, but there's, there's a lot of moving parts. So yes. it doesn't surprise me now that a team in, in a little bit of financial, you know, I would say just in a bad financial spot is maybe trying to find a way to save a few bucks on the amount of money that's owed to him. Cause do you, do you have the exact amount before I hit the, the, the uh, statement here? I can find it really quickly. Okay. Because I, I know it was a seven year, $245 million deal that runs through 2026 but it has a lot of, uh, you know, kind of deferrals in it. Yeah. So Strasburg, here we go. Um, next year he's owed 35, 25, he's owed 35, 26, he's owed 35. Um, upcoming deferred. Yes. 10 mil deferred to 2027, 10 to 28, 10 to 29, 10 to 2030. So it's like a total like 80 ish. Yeah. And he makes three, Oh wow! So 2027, eight and nine, he makes 26.7 each year. Yeah. So he's owed what? He's owed about 80. Yeah. So I get that they don't want to pay that. I get it. But it, you gave it to him. It, the way it works though is if you retire, if you file your retirement paperwork, then you don't get paid. Like you, you're just you're done. You're out of the league. Gil Metch did that because he felt like he was which I respect like kind of falling on your sword like that. I think he was owed another 11, $12 million when he signed that big deal. Uh, and he was good in the front end of it too. It's not nearly like the situation here, but Gil match ends up retiring because of shoulder issues and, and calls it a day and leaves tens of mil- over $10 million on the table. I appreciate that. And I respect that. Everybody has the right to do that, but also Steven Strasburg doesn't have to give up the money that was, was owed to him. Like I, I understand that, it's it's unfortunate and and sucks for the Nationals, but the quote from the Nationals on after it was canceled, you know, after the whole situation was canceled because he didn't agree to whatever they wanted to agree to, I thought was well, first of all the learners almost never issue statements, which is Mark Learner almost never issue statements. Yeah. And two, I thought there was a lot of like sassiness and like backhanded shit in this. It is regrettable that private discussions have been made public through anonymous sources attempting to negotiate through the media. While we have been following the process required by the collective bargaining agreement, behind the scenes preparations for a press conference had begun internally. However, no such event was ever confirmed by the team or promoted publicly. It is unfortunate that external leaks in the press have mischaracterized these events. And here's the ominous part. It is our hope that ongoing conversations remain private out of respect for the individuals involved. Until then, we look forward to seeing Steven when we report to spring training. That one really, that's the part that really got me. You're going to make this motherfucker report to spring training when he's physically incapable of the throw. He has nerve damage. He can't throw. He, 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 for portions of, apparently when he stood up for too long, couldn't feel his arm. Like thoracic outlet, and then having it kind of come back, he's had major nerve issues and they'd rather hold him hostage because they know, Hey, we'll, we'll just kind of play a game of chicken here. It, it's, it's a disadvantage for the nationals because they have to keep that 40 man spot. Yes. You can put them on the 60 day, day, 60 day IL during the season, but during the off season, he takes up a 40 man spot. You don't want that. That's a disadvantage for you as a team, yeah. but they're willing to do that. And make him sit it out like and and he'll have to show up, like he'll have to go to spring training because he can get, yeah. You know, I think I'm sure there's stipulations in the contract where they can kind of find him and do things like that. So he's gonna have to be there and be paraded around almost almost embarrassed, right? Like it, it's it's almost it's so demoralizing to make him do this. And you know, what maybe he do. could work out a maybe he could work out a deal and take a little bit less, and that's what they're trying to do right now. I think that's what they're trying to leverage, but it seems like if they had all of this going, they clearly had it planned. Uh, even if they announced it publicly or not, the Strasburgs are coming into town. The media members all seemed very sure that this was happening. Clearly somebody, when one of their counsel, somebody stepped up and said, hey, we can, we can leverage a way to save some money here because they're probably looking at the books, seeing how fucked they are financially. And they're saying, hey, we can, we can, we can figure out a way to leverage against Steven here and, and make him take a little bit less. Yeah, so and, I- that's my interpretation of it. That's it's purely guessing, but- 
That's how it kind of looks. And that statement did nothing but validate that that hypothesis to me. Yeah, so I undershot it massively. Actually, I'm looking at this again. So he's owed 35 million in 24, 25, and 26. In 27, he's owed 26.7. In 28, he's owed 26.7. 29, he's owed 26.7. Um, he has deferred 11 and a half million dollars each year that like this contract has been active. So the next 110 so million. No, 185 million. It says, I'm looking at Nats canceled Strasburg retirement presser now saying they don't want to pay the full 110 million left. I, maybe that doesn't include the deferral. So yeah. So 35 times three and then the remainder of this year would get them to 110, but that's not including the deferred money, which adds another $80 million. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, this is a lot of money that we're yeah, talking get about it. here. I get it. I get it. I get it. I, get I just... It. It, but again, don't don't make it sound like you're going to do one thing and then renege and, and do another. And I think that's clearly what what was happening here. And OK, make Strasburg go to spring training. She can go there, fail a physical, be demoralized and 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 go to the I.L. Like if you want to sit on that 40 man spot okay. being clogged up every offseason for the remainder of time, like, OK, do that, I guess. So fall of 2019 you remember Syracuse played Liberty in football and Hugh Freeze had that infection on his back I want to say or like some sort of infection he was bedridden so he coached from a hospital bed in a suite and you've got that photo of Dino Babers pointing up to Hugh Freeze and Freeze pointing down from the hospital bed do you remember that yeah like that's kind of what they're going to do with Strasburg I feel like he's going to be in a suite at the spring training ballpark and he's going to be in a hospital bed like pointing down on everybody is like the Hugh Freeze element (laughs) It, what the last thing I'll say, thing. yeah, what, what's your thoughts? I mean, I just kind of went off like on the on the optics of it. Like, I, I guess I understand the national side of it of wanting to recoup some of the money because he has not pitched in three years. They've paid him the last three years pretty much too. And and there's a lot of money on the table, but again, they gave it to him. And Scott Boris isn't backing down. That's his agent, by the way. So even if Steven maybe wants to just put an end to this, and by the way, I, I mentioned it a couple of times on the show, after that brutal start, the, one, the last start of his career, yeah. you know, he couldn't have been more kind and open and just willing to answer anything. Yeah. And and he's been a pro's pro since day one. So it's just, it's shocking to me that one of the best and most important players in their franchise's history, no matter how poorly it's ended is getting this kind of treatment because they are this much. I think that they're this hell bent on saving money, which I, it's a lot of fucking money. It's a lot. But is it that much different than what the Yankees might have to be dealing with the Stanton? Like, yes, he's playing. Is it that much better that he's playing right now? Like, there's plenty no. of other contracts that are, I mean, this is the worst, but that are close to as bad or really bad. Like, how did the Prince Fielder situation go? What, what did he get? Wasn't that contract insured? I also, again, it's it kind of their insured. fault. Insure the fucking contract on a yeah. guy. Maybe they couldn't get a policy. Actually. Maybe they couldn't get a policy. Who, right. Who so the fact that the Nats didn't get the contract insured is fascinating to me. Um, and I don't maybe know the intricacies of that. Yeah, maybe they couldn't get a maybe they couldn't have gotten a policy. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just view it from the optics standpoint. And if I was if I was between the two, I would just say, Well, this is a big clusterfuck. You guys figure it out. Like I I would want I nothing think that's exactly to what do he's doing with this. Yeah. I think it's I, I would want nothing to do with this because, yeah, would the Nats like to have 100 of that 185 left? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I understand that they don't want to just like give $185 million to a guy that's pretty much an ambassador for the for the organization. And you pretty much spoiled that relationship now. But also like, damn it, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, you know who who probably wants that money just as bad, even if it's 10 percent of it. Scott Boris. And uh-huh. Boris ain't going to back down. So uh-huh. I agree. I think Strasburg's probably hands up saying, go do what you got to do. Just letting you know, I'm, I'll take less. <laughs> I'll be, I I'll be you, rich either way. And I, Boris I bet is you like, he's like, he's like, whatever, man. Like, I don't want to deal with this. And Boris is probably like, leave me to it. I got this. And it's really probably about Boris at this point. Like, let me get my cut of this money. Because, of course, he doesn't get the cut if they don't pay him. So it's Boris fighting for his money as well. So I think that's the really interesting wrinkle of it. And that's what I kind of got as well from the, the quote is like Steven's getting caught in the crosshairs here. It's like, we look forward to Steven reporting the spring train. Like that's posturing and language that is, I think, directed at Scott Boris. And it's like, yes. how much are you going to let Steven go through before you just back down a little bit? I, that's kind of how I sense it. So I'm interested to see how this continues to unfold because this is some high drama. 
uh, and in a way that it's just this poor guy, man, like he already had his career taken from him in terms of how much longer we thought it could be. And now he has to have such a chaotic end to things. Uh, I just hope we get to a solution soon. Credit for him for trying for this long. It's been since 2020. Yeah. I would have thrown the towel in like midway through 21. I think if I felt as shitty as he probably did, but the fact that it took until the end of the 23 season for this all to come to a head is like commendable for him. Like this guy gave every ounce of his effort to come back to a major league bound and he just couldn't do it yeah. and his body wouldn't let him. So, all right, that's it. Uh, Walker Bueller tomorrow. Good conversation with Walker, uh, with Peter Apple. Um, and then Arm and Peter will talk to you on Wednesday. Look out for the call up mailbag coming early this week. Uh, and every link you need is in the episode description. We will talk to you guys tomorrow.